Um, so special, special, special guest yeah. today. My long lost brother. <laughs> yeah, you don't you don't ponytail it though. I don't. You just let it flow. Farrah yeah, Fawcett rock. style. Yeah, more yeah, of, me and Farrah. More of a musician. Uh, sort of. I claim to be one. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So this is rock and roll, and and you're just, just, just fucking hardcore. That's right. <laughs> I don't know. Smooth, Ooh, smooth, smooth jazz. jazz. <laughs> Some new age smooth jazz. I play an instrument, but it's not really music. We'll get into that later. Ooh. Is it? Is that podcast a, topics? <laughs> I, I, I play with myself too. <laughs> I, I don't grow a ponytail to do it. No. All right. Um, Jay. So Yo, Ian McCullough, imagine, our buddy. Imagine Kevin what? with a ponytail. Like, <laughs> no hair the skull like a George Costanza <laughs> with a ponytail. What if I just wore, I could just wear, a, if I wore, well, my ha- hair is low in the back too. If, yeah. I, if I wore the right hat though, I could grow the ponytail. Nobody knows. No one would know. You just put a fake it. ponytail on the back of the hat. <laughs> oh yeah, that's right. They make those. Yeah, not for men like me though. <laughs> I'm we try it. I, I'm a, hey, having hair would be cool a lot of the time. Mm-hmm. But you know, really when it's really cold or it's sunny. Otherwise I don't mind being bald. Mm-hmm. I just wish it would all fall out so I don't have to shave that yeah. little that little remnants, the little the little hat brim around the edge I got going there. That, Why don't you get like that laser hair removal stuff? What if they come up at the same time I do that? Let's say in this <laughs> parallel universe, they come up with a way to grow the hair back on top. Then I'm fucked. Yeah, then I just true, got that true. Marine Corps <laughs> shit going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, oh. I ain't down with that. That's true. <laughs> like, I would just have, like, ponytail on top. Yeah, would be tight. No, it would. It'd give me a headache. Yeah, I, I'm not into that. That's true. I'm okay with, I, I don't even know. But I, I tell you what, being bald my entire adult life, if I could... Oh man, if I could grow hair now, I'd probably never cut it. That's why I stopped cutting it. Or, really? You yeah. afraid of going bald? Because I've no. I seen what you got going on under there. I don't think you got to no. worry about it. No, no. I got out of the military and was just like, I'm just going to not cut my hair. And now yeah. I haven't. I'll trim it every now and again, but that's it. Ladies like it? Allegedly. Allegedly? Yeah. What's the. Le- you? I got a girlfriend, yeah. She likes it? Yeah. She wants you to cut it? No. What about you? Why why you have long hair? Because it seems like a tactical disadvantage. Oh, it absolutely is. It's a huge pain, a lot of the time. Uh, inertia is largely why I have it. Just inertia. Yeah. What do you What do you mean? I've always had it long, so I just keep it long because I'm used to it. Also, uh, if I change it, I'll get a ton of comments, and I don't want to deal with that. That's true. Really, you guys give a shit what people say. Well, but think about like crisscross stopped wearing their pants backwards, and then one of them died. Exactly. <laughs> and no one cared anymore. <laughs> I mean, it's true. They're from Atlanta. Yeah. Little homie, shout out, Chris, man. Yeah. Warm it up, Chris. Yeah. <laughs> I'm about that's, to. What, that's what he was born to do. <laughs> that's what he was born to do. Um, so you just have always had long hair, and you're like, yeah. fuck it, I'm keeping it. Yeah, I like it. It is, it's absolutely obnoxious it, t- from time to time, like when it's windy or in the morning when it's wet. Mm-hmm. That, uh, I feel like all the time it's a pain in the ass. No? No. Oh, this is interesting. Just These choices, like you know, God made my choice. I guess that's okay, <laughs> or, or genetics, yeah, whoever yeah. you want to blame. Um, I wouldn't be oh. gun Jesus if I didn't have the long hair. That's oh, right. is that what it is? Your gun Jesus? Well, that's, gun I Jesus. wouldn't want to give that name up. I tell you what, that's right, gun Jesus. So you think because because you you have some followers. How how many? Um, all right. So Ian's forgotten weapons. Yep. The most prolific gun videos in the history of the YouTubes. Ever. Uh, 2,800 videos. Is that what you've done? <laughs> Give or take at this moment. Yeah. Give or take. How, how many subscribers you got? Uh, just under 2.4 million right now. Oh, I thought it was like five. Oh, oh that ain't shit. 2.4 <laughs> r- <laughs> <laughs> million for gun videos. And most of it is stuff I've never even heard of. Hopefully. Yeah, it's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, I was, because most of your videos are what, like 10 minutes? Yeah, I try to aim for 8 to 12. Yeah. That's a lot of your life, man. Um, yes, it is. How long have you been on YouTube? 11 years now. Started the channel in 2011. Like you and Joe Rogan. Damn, yeah. One of the pioneers. Mm. 2011. Yep. 2,800 videos. Yeah. So for a couple of years, I was doing a f- I was doing six videos a week. I've dropped it to five this year. Oh, 
Get, getting right. soft. What are you doing with all that extra time? <laughs> well, what I do with all the extra time is now I also have a publishing company. All right. So yeah. I'm writing books. Oh, that's that right. We're extra. doing a book. Yes, we are. You're, I forgot that's about Allegedly it. why I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was actually, I'm, I'm so interested in like your story and all. Mm. We sat down, like, obviously I remember we're doing a book. I didn't remember it today. I'm just <laughs> thinking about like all the stuff I want to ask you because it's fascinating to me. Like early adopter of the YouTubes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, Hit me. What do you got? All right. Where should we well, start? I have, what, what What do you got? You got? You want to know question. what he uses in his hair? No, no, no. I have a question, and I mean, it's we're probably going to end up skipping around, but um, you have a pretty big affinity for French firearms. Um, <coughs> and have you discussed why <coughs> that is? Have you ever discussed yeah. fully why it is? Yeah. Well, yeah, that, I haven't heard it. All so. right. So <laughs> focus on my personal collection is French. Yeah. First book I wrote was a collector's guide to French rifles, mm-hmm. military rifles. Because there was nothing, essentially nothing, written on the subject before. Right. Uh, what, attra- what attracted well, me to them? They never fought in a war. They just ran away. Dude. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know who the most prolific military is right now across the world? I don't. The French. What the does French that mean? are all over Africa. They're the ones uh, actually out there shooting people. That's true. They're in Mali going crazy. They've been all over North Africa for yeah. decades yeah. doing stuff, sneaky stuff that they don't really publicize right. that much, but right. they're out there. Yeah, I feel good, doing good work. The hitters. I feel like the French would be sneaky. I know a couple of guys who know some guys in Mali, and they said they are real hitters over there. Yeah, you talk to the guys who worked with them in Iraq or Afghanistan, and oh yeah, I've only ever heard good things. Absolutely, I believe it. So, what attracted me to their firearms in the first place is that they're different. Right. So, I in general just like different. Like mm-hmm. I like novelty. That's what interests me. You know, if I work on the same specific gun for too long, well, even if it's a really crazy weird gun, it gets old, it gets boring, like, eh, I want to find something new and different, mm-hmm. which is really what has propelled the channel. Like, if I was willing to sit down and just spend a year on a single gun, I wouldn't have the variety on the channel. Right. But, so, most of the world's militaries adopt, at any given time, pretty much the same thing. You look at it today, how many different countries have adopted the 416? True. Like, a ton of them. It's like the standard NATO rifle now. Um, 75 years ago that was the mauser every major military in the world more well like half of them had essentially car 98 case Mm -hmm. made by a couple different countries but they're all the same gun before that remington rolling blocks Mm -hmm. were a massively popular worldwide gun the french never adopted any of that stuff they always wanted to do their own development and their own manufacturing in their own state arsenal system and then they're all state-run arsenals, and the French government had really no profit motive to sell them widely. So you didn't have a company, like a French version of Mauser, selling these guns across the world. You had the couple of big French arsenals. They'll make them, and there will be one or two little export contracts because they're politically expedient. But then other than that, they don't go anywhere. So French guns are all different designs, and they're, only, they're pretty much exclusively used by the French. And to me, that makes them interesting. On That's top of cool. that, there's nothing written, so it's kind of an interesting mystery to explore. Nobody cares, uh, essentially, what you were getting into at the beginning, unintentionally. But, yeah, yeah. you know, it's what do collectors know about French rifles that, you know, never fired, only dropped once. Yeah. Which means prices are low. Right. No one's out there trying to buy them up. So it was a collecting specialty that I found interesting, accessible, and affordable. Yeah. That's cool. And yeah, I mean, now you're cool. giving, now you're creating that um, interest in them as well, which is cool. I hope so. Yeah. I think they're worth I think, it. Yeah. I think yeah. so. Oh, the French, I know it was interesting and fascinating. That was one thing I thought about right away because I have collected guns and machine guns and stuff for a long time. And it, yeah, 30 years ago it was different, but now, yeah, just being able to afford stuff that you can afford. And, and you said you've got like a couple hundred French rifles, like... That's a lot. I have a pretty significant collection, yeah. Yeah, and so to be able to afford that, yeah, if that were all the rare German stuff or something. Oh, forget yeah, about it. Yeah. Couldn't do it. Even today, I couldn't afford it. Like, yeah. I, I was buying them up when nobody cared and there wasn't anything written. We've had inflation in gun prices in general. Plus, um, there was a big bump, especially in LaBelle's and Berthier's, about five years ago, well, five to ten years ago, with the anniversary of World War One. Oh, did that coincide with your book or anything? Closely, not quite exactly. Um, I was writing the book in 16, 17, Uh 15, 16, 17. Um, But the LaBelle in particular, people like 
realized, oh, this was actually a thing. Like mm-hmm. this was a gun and we kind of forgot about it. But now it's 100 years since the end of World War One, and prices of the LaBelle just went through the roof. Yeah, it's interesting when when I got into guns in the later 80s, early 90s, even all the World War II stuff was really affordable. Like it wasn't that long ago. Like I saw a, a real rise in prices about the time Private Ryan came out, the late 90s. Stuff got really expensive. German stuff, U.S. military, World War II stuff. You know, it all went up five or ten times in price, it seemed like. Yeah. yeah. What is, in your opinion, what is the most popular, I wouldn't necessarily say prolific, but what's the most well-known French military firearm? It, like, is the is the Lamat French, the revolver? Sort of. Fake French? It is. Like me? It's a French designer, but... And some of them are made in France, but um, it's really much better known as a Confederate gun. Yeah. Um, LaBelle's fairly well known. We have a couple of the later guns that came into the U.S. in really substantial numbers. The Moss 36 and the Moss 4956. Mm -hmm. When the French army decided to call them obsolete and surplus them, the vast majority came into the U.S. Um, In fact, the 4956 is the, the deal was... They were sold to the U.S., I think, at scrap value with the condition that they couldn't ever be sent back to France <laughs> because their gun control laws are obscene. Um, but we have all those guns. In fact, right. that's where the only dropped once nonsense comes yeah, from. Yeah, yeah. Well, what had happened is the, when the French put all these guns into storage because they're second, third tier guns, they rearsenaled all of them first. So anything that had any wear on it got refinished, got new furniture, and then put into war reserve. And then when they sell it a surplus, it's never been out of war reserve until they sell it a surplus. So it comes into the U.S. in pristine, like new condition or like new arsenal refurb mm. condition. And so that was one of the marketing taglines for one of the importers. Hmm. Like perfect condition, never fired, only dropped once. <laughs> and it's been the sticky meme in the American firearms collecting community for like 50 years. So that grinds your gears a little bit, huh? And it's it's undeserved. You look at World War I, like the French took massive numbers of casualties and didn't surrender. They actually, you know, I want to remind people, they did win that war, actually. More than the South can say. Oh, <laughs> burn, burn. Well, you know, it's, it's not like the Luger. Lost both World Wars. Damn, that's true. <laughs> the Luger sucks. I mean, the Luger's cool. It sucks, though. It's cool. That's all it, I know about it. It's obsolete. It was when it came out, 1905. No one will argue that it's not one of the two best handguns, military handguns in the world in 1905. Oh, yeah. Actually, 1905, there's a really good argument that it's the best because your alternative is a Colt 1905. Is that the one that looks like a Tokarev? No, that's the 1910. Yeah. Yeah. The 05's it's better, but it's not a 1911 yet. You got one of those? I don't think so. Yeah. There's not a lot of... Uh, 1905s are out there. There's not a lot of the like 07s, 09s, 1910s. Those are really, really rare guns. Yeah. I don't think I have any of that stuff. Mm. Huh. Well, how... Uh, where'd you grow up? You grew up in Colorado. Yeah, Denver. Denver. So how'd you get into guns? Uh, my dad collected guns. Oh, I did? Uh, he collected Arasakas. Oh. And it was actually pretty cool. In his office, he had a pegboard wall. And he had Arasaka's, like, 60 of them on the wall. And with the 99 specifically, he had them organized chronologically, which with the Arasaka means at the top of the wall are these beautiful pre-war guns, really well-made, well-finished, with, like, Swiss Army watch levels of stuff on them. Anti-aircraft sights, dust covers, monopods, the works. And then by 45, they're making what looks like dangerous garbage. (laughs) Like, it's still safe to shoot, but mass like the the barrels almost look like they're externally threaded because there's such prolific lathe marking still on the barrels the hand guards are gone the butt plate has been replaced by a piece of wood and some nails uh, fixed sights like incredibly crude but it wasn't it, it was a very uh, incremental process where they slowly got rid of fancy features and slowly made the gun simpler and when you look at them all displayed in order it's really neat. I think it's really neat to, to watch that Yeah, it's that fascinating. You, yeah. you know, I have that with a collection of guns. I have a collection of Beretta submachine guns. Yeah. 38s. Yep. 
and oh my 38 a maybe beautiful gun full wood stock the shroud the finish is immaculate the gun is wonderful and then when you get to like the what are they, the 38, 42s? 42s and 43s, Oh, yeah. they just look like a kindergartner made them. Yeah. Yeah, very crude, short in the stock, no barrel shroud. Yep. Yeah, they just, I mean, it's like every month they eliminated a feature <laughs> or a process on the guns, and you see the stock get that way, the gun get that way, the barrels, they fluted the barrels, and they stopped fluting the barrels, and it's like they had an integral sort of compensator muzzle device thing. They get rid of that. I mean, it's just the whole thing is... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's did, pretty interesting to see what do they yeah, do these Ward things did. just out of necessity to pump out more. Yeah, not because they were yeah, like, the, oh, we don't need this anymore. Well, all these sorts of guns, like before the war, y- you know, it's it's there wasn't such a demand. The guns were very nice, and then during the war, you know, they had to issue guns to ten times as many people. And yeah, yeah, it's like whatever they could do to get a functioning firearm. Basically, I think there's a really interesting question that is, why don't people ever make guns more like that in the first place like every time a war comes up where industrial capacity really gets taxed every single country realizes we've got all this extraneous junk on the gun like we'll cut it off because we need to make more of them if it's extraneous yeah just don't make it in the first place and the the italian m38 carcanos are kind of like that oh yeah they had fixed sights like they have 200 meter sights on them because how often were guys really taking that the Mauser and setting the sight to 900 meters. Right. Like well, and that's one of the more expensive parts of the guns to make. I mean, even with like the USM 79 grenade launcher, I think that sight <laughs> was more expensive than like the rest of the gun. To Probably. Build. Yeah. And yeah. So if you don't need to make all that, and it's a lot of moving parts, a lot of small mm-hmm. parts, it's a delicate part of the firearm. I mean, I think to some degree, like I don't want to make crude stuff, but, but I think that goes into a lot of our do- design philosophy at Q. It's like, well, do we need these still sling swivels that weigh combined three ounces? Mm-hmm. Do we need, you know, all this other stuff that's loose and rattles and it's big and heavy? Like, how do we get rid of shed all of the stuff that you don't really need to use the firearm? Well, yeah. we're continuing that, too. I mean, we're removing the dust cover on the honey badger. Yeah. Like, it causes more malfunctions than it than it prevents. So why use it? Yeah, you know, it's something that people, it's funny because when we did the Honey Badger, you know, as which is, I think we'll probably shoot a video, probably be part of the book that we're doing, the Silencer book. Um, what well, was designed to replace the MP5SD. You know, there was no requirement for that gun to have a dust cover on it. like Or a Ford Assist. Yeah, so why why should it be on the gun that replaces it? You know, because it's not, it's not designed for the same purposes that led you know, stoner, the the U S military to decide to put a dust cover on that gun. Mm -hmm. You know, this was designed to be a submachine gun. You could shoot people far away with, you know, not crawl through the surf with it or whatever. I don't know. That's my favorite, uh, kind of like gun guy argument is the, the Ford assist thing. Like I've seen copies of stoner's drawings. I don't, I never saw Ford assist on any of those. The guy's saying you need to have a Ford Assist on AR. I've never well, was I, designed with it. I asked Reed Knight one time with um so we'll shoot the what well, we're gonna shoot the Mark eleven motto today. And I asked him about Ford Assist once. And because I think the army wanted it at one point on the M one ten. And his argument was, yeah, we can put Ford Assist on it, but you know, this is a precision rifle. Like this is designed to be like a semi automatic sniper rifle. That's like the name of the program right. now, actually. And he's like, if you have a round that's not going to go into the chamber, you know, you on its own, it? like, why would you cram it in there? It's like, this is a precision gun. This isn't a battle rifle. And and that, in his mind, was the reason, like, it shouldn't be on that rifle. Yeah. Makes sense. Have yeah, you ever, it did to me, too. I mean, have you ever no seen, uh, you may have seen it. There's a, uh, it's kind of like some folklore or whatever. It's like an old wives' tale in, uh, like, Iraqi Kurdistan. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, I know where this is the going. sniper button. Yep. Yeah. What? So, There's a sniper button. Yeah. The, Jeez, I, I want to level up to that. <laughs> yeah. The forward assist. They believe if you hold the forward assist while you fire, it'll make it more accurate. It's a good way to this, smash your thumb. This but. is this comes out of the same sort of people who will uh, run the sight all the way out to its maximum setting because it they, makes the gun more powerful. More powerful. Yeah. Shoots, yeah, yeah. Shoots, shoots harder. Yeah. Shout out to my buddy Miles Vining. <laughs> 
Yes. Who is the one who, yeah. who, who I think brought that to a lot of people's attention. Yeah. Well, okay. So the site thing, that's dumb. The forward assist thing, I can at least understand the argument of, okay, so we're going to stop moving parts. Well, I think that they saw Maybe? bolt action guns. No, see, there is no mechanical understanding that goes into this. It's a button. Yeah. And someone at some point. it's got a little point, bullseye on it. Yeah, someone at some point. Because <laughs> that's a bullseye on the yeah. board assist, the circles. Yeah. For, <laughs> that's some sort of knurling or whatever. It was one of, some of the one of those guys, Afghanistan, Kurdistan, who's like, oh, yeah, it's totally, it makes it more accurate. Didn't, you know, didn't know why. And then everyone else went, oh, well, <laughs> oh, okay. okay. I, Imagine I, doing that. I, I, <laughs> no. <laughs> hurt. But I, w- I will say, and I enjoy the fact that when I'm going hunting and I'm going to shoot live animals, that I've trained a lot and practiced a lot. And I feel more confident. And when I feel more confident, I know I shoot better. Maybe that's it. Just a psychological <laughs> thing. Hey, if I hold this, I'm going to shoot better. Maybe you do. I don't know. It seems well, ridiculous. Well, that's the thing. If you grow up and someone hands you a gun and the, the the only person that you have to look up to that is the village gun guy goes, hey, press that button. It's going to make you more accurate. You're going to oh, probably okay. do it. That's funny. I hadn't heard this one. I like it, though. Well, your, your dad collected the Japanese stuff. Yep. Arasaka's. Wrote a book on them, too. Did he? Yep. So little, you, little thin introductory collector's volume. No interest in like the Nambus or anything like that. Like the, um, he had a couple of them, but his focus was the rifles. Yeah. So, okay. So you're just a, a genetic product, just like me being bald. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's pretty awesome. What 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 what'd your parents do for a living? Uh, my dad was an archivist, so he worked for uh, state and local government doing records. Okay, it's making more and more yeah, sense. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, so your mom owned a beauty salon? No. No, <laughs> no although you're not, you're not that far off. My mother was actually a seamstress. Oh. Um, she did uh, custom costumes. Oh, cool. Uh, the, the focus of her work for a long time, like when I was growing up, the focus of her work was figure skating costumes for ice skaters. Oh, wow. Yeah. Tanya Harding. <sighs> yeah. She was framed. <laughs> yeah, she was. <laughs> Oh uh, God. God, that's kind of cool. A, what a weird disaster that was. But it, the, I don't know. Both of those things make perfect sense. Knowing you now, <laughs> like I, yeah, so we saw. Of course, your, they were. We saw your figure skating outfit. Earlier. <laughs> it's the hair. Yeah, the hair goes. With it. That's what it is. Um, well, that's interesting. So, so what'd you do? You grow up. Did, were you into shooting then? I got into shooting when I was in early high school. Yeah. Um, my dad didn't do a lot of shooting. Uh, he had when he was younger, but when I was around, he was basically just a collector. Yeah. Uh, but of course, guns are cool. So I wanted to, you know, I got interested. And yeah. Of course, for me, that meant shooting. Yeah. Um, when I got to school, to university, I joined the, the Purdue pistol team. I went to Purdue. Yeah. Boilermakers. Yep. Yo. Um, Why did you go to Purdue? Because that's, that's <laughs> Southern Indiana, right? Yeah. Yeah, uh, when I got out of high school, what I really wanted to do was design aircraft. I wanted to build airplanes because they're cool too. Yeah, yeah, they are cool. And so I, I went looking for what are the best aeronautical engineering departments, and it was it was Purdue, University of Michigan, Virginia. And I can't remember the other one. It it wasn't Emory Riddle because they're they're flying the airplanes, yeah, that's not flying building them. In Daytona, yeah. But I can't remember the other one. But I applied to all three. I got accepted to Purdue. And so I went there and I spent two years in aeronautical engineering before it finally really got through my head that none of these people, like if I graduate from this, I'm not going to go build airplanes. Yeah. Like my one shot would be to get hired by Burt Rutan at the time, uh, who's building all sorts of really cool experimental, um, exotic aircraft. You know, he yeah. built the plane that flew around the world without landing he was doing some of the early uh, civilian spacecraft. That seems way better than going to work for a commercial yeah. company yes. building airplanes. Yeah, but my grades weren't like top of the class. And his company had something like 20 employees. And I looked at him like, my chances of getting hired by Burt Rutan are approaching zero. And here I am watching you know, my roommate two years ahead of me. gets He graduates. He gets hired by NASA. But they second him to Boeing, and he spends six months redesigning the steering gear of the nose wheel of the space shuttle. It's like, that's that's not fun. Yeah, it's that's not glamorous by any means. And I think that's cool, no? No, well, no, that's not cool. That's not cool? No. Space shuttle's cool, but 
that kind of project. Well, fuck, you got to steer it. It's, it doesn't fly its fucking self, Ian. Yeah, but it's like being really into guns and you graduate and you get hired by a company and you spend six months redesigning the, the, the shape of the trigger of the Remington 700. That's, that's not the fun part. I don't know that I, I agree. Know. Well, at any I rate, it was steer the space shuttle. Why do they need to steer anyway? They fly on the backs of... Like yeah, but when they land, that's true. Yeah. It literally, it's just, just when straight. the thing lands on the ground. Yeah, so something that you're using two percent of the time seems yeah. muy importante. Yeah. And in any case, the work is it's all just a ton of calculus. I I want to like yeah. draw a biplane on a napkin and then go build it. Yeah, sounds cool, Kevin. Calculus. Yeah, but instead it's just oh yeah, endless a napkin of airplanes. <laughs> oh, that <laughs> I'd yeah. rather I'd rather fucking land safely. I don't know what you guys are doing this morning. <laughs> Jeez, so, pulling stuff out of the evidence locker again. <laughs> So I end up changing majors to mechanical engineering technology, which is like halfway between pure engineering and machining. So yeah. the purpose of the degree, and it's it's actually a degree program that's fairly rare, but Purdue had one. It's intended for like a factory floor manager mm-hmm. who needs to be able to look at a set of blueprints and go, we don't have the tooling to make this cut over here. And then also go down onto the shop floor and pull apart off the line and be like, uh, you know, we have... I don't know what, at random, you know, assess the quality of the machining work as well and interface between engineering and machining departments. What I liked about that was it was, that. it was hands on. Yeah. So we did welding, we did casting, we did lathe work, mill work, CNC. So I ended up with a degree in that. Well, what'd you do when you got out of school then? Not that. <laughs> <laughs> I've never really. I worked in my mother's floor. He ended up, he ended up redesigning the steering <laughs> gears for the, for the space, space shuttle. shuttle. Uh, yeah, I work for NASA. It wasn't <laughs> fabulous. <laughs> so, okay. So honestly, my my plan coming out of college was like these normal jobs kind of seem like they suck a lot. Um, I agree with and, you. And We're I, on the same page now. I'd rather not do one. And so, okay. So how do we not have a job? There are two ways. Either make a ton of money or not need a ton of money. And not needing a ton of money seemed like the more approachable path. A, so, I go with A. <laughs> a is the more fun path, mm. but at age 20 out of school, it's like, how do I make, you know, like, uh, I don't know, making a million dollars seems really hard. But uh, what I ended up doing was I had a little bit of inheritance money. Yeah, 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 yeah. Nice. Um, inheritance. I want to get me some of that. Well, Aiden shit ass, he'd probably get some <laughs> of that. I mean, like really, really small amount. Um, went up to northern Arizona where land is dirt cheap off the grid. And I bought a, a parcel of property in the middle of absolute nowhere and uh, started building an off-grid house on it. And this was Figured. your route to a million dollars? No, this no, was my route to not needing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was going to, Because you're taking a long way around with that. So oh, you build the house yourself. There's no mortgage. Mm-hmm. Uh, off-grid, you're putting in your own power system, your own well, your own septic system. There are no utility bills. Mm-hmm. This is how I was approaching this. Mm. So how much money do I need to live on? Very comfortably? Mm, very little. Like, that's what people spend all their money on. So how do you avoid having those expenses? Now, building the house turned out to be possibly a little harder than I anticipated. Um, So I I ended up... Usually everything's three times harder, it seems, even for smart people. Yeah. So I I bounced around a bit. I ended up uh, working as a bartender for a couple of years just to raise money. That's the ponytail. That's (laughs) where it happened. The the beard comes from that. Mm. Because I was getting shit from uh, customers about whether I was old enough to actually serve drinks. And the moment I grew in a beard, those stopped. I don't, so. I don't ever remember hearing that. <laughs> <laughs> I've looked like a grandpa since I was 18. Uh, so Shut uh, up, Tom. Essentially, what happened is I ended up finishing the house. I lived there for a little while. Yeah. And that's where I was, I was getting more interested in guns. I started Forgotten Weapons as a website to archive. It was mostly documents and photos. Okay, so at this point, y- y- you never really, you had a job. You didn't have a... Potential I, career or anything? Not really. Um, by the end of this, so I ended up moving back down into the city. And when I did that, I got a job with a solar power company. So I had no formal education in it, but I had built my own off-grid power system for the house. And I leveraged that into working a sales You're a position. You're a smart guy. went to yeah. school. I mean, it's, it wasn't that complicated. Yeah. Um, and th- that was the closest I had to a real career. I worked that for several years. Several years. Well, let me ask you. So, so when you graduate and you go to northern Arizona off the grid, w- what were your parents saying or thinking? Uh, in retrospect, it's remarkable that they let me do that. 
Um, but I think they had confidence that I'd figure it out one way or another. Really? Well, I mean, what, I'm not going to die out there. I got a truck. Yeah, I've got I, some neighbors. I don't, you know, I absolutely don't worry about my son starving to death. And in America, like, you have to try to starve to death. Like, I don't even know how yeah. you would do it. Yeah. But I do, I only worry about him putting himself in a situation to have a stressful or anxiety filled, just unhappy life. Like, I, I don't worry about, like, you know, basic things like him eating or having shelter. It's just like, you know, the stuff I think that really ruins your life in America, we're so spoiled as you just make, you know, we have the ability because it's so comfortable here to make stupid fucking choices that ruin your life. But like with your son, you can't, there's nothing you can do to like exert more energy to make sure he doesn't have a stressful life. That's yeah. all on him. Probably no, the harder I mean, you push that, the worse it's actually going to work out. I mean, I've tried smacking him, burning him with cigarettes, you name it. He Didn't work. Does what he wants to do. Christine's He's just snap. tough. No, no, <laughs> Christine, that's a joke. Everyone, <laughs> Christine's our attorney. Uh, no, I mean it is true. You know, for me, it was part of starting a, a company. Part of starting Q was to show, like, I realized, you know, I had my children. I mean, I, I wasn't really young. Like, I think I had Aiden when I was thirty, maybe thirty-one, and you know, like, I was relatively successful then, like financially. And so my kids grew up, you know, in a big house like this. They had nannies. You know, we had a lake. Pl- like, when you realize they get a little older and, you know, they're whatever, 10, 11, 12. And, like, they were just born rich. They don't understand, like, what the, the 20 years prior to that, you know, or 15 years, what went into, you know, and then just getting lucky. So, like, starting key was another way to show my kids, hey, you know, like, I can't teach you a lot of shit. I don't know. But being an entrepreneur and if you, you you know if you have a good idea you work hard to do these things you can start something from nothing you know you don't yeah if you want to work for somebody too that's great like i don't think i could but i wish i could the house building for me was a, a really good example of that i don't know how much i realized it at the time mm. but i literally started with a patch of dirt yeah and i built a house on it seems mostly by myself mm. yeah seems overwhelming uh, to like me when i moved up there i lived in a van like a panel van and then I upgraded that to like a 18 foot trailer. Yeah, I'd have been so. like, do I really need a house? <laughs> yes, <laughs> okay. yes, I do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you want to you bring girls over. <laughs> can't, can't bring them to the van. <laughs> Whoa, I mean, you bring the van sure. to them. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure there are some girls that are down with that. But. The, the one that really hit was after I'd, I had put in away well, enough money to do the, the major construction, and I was up at the property. And at that point, I was living in my neighbor's barn. Uh, cause there was one enclosed, like furnished, wasn't heated. It didn't have running water or it had running water, but it wasn't potable running water and it wasn't hot running water. It was just like, we have some pressure from the well over here. So you got some running water. Uh, and I, I was working all summer long and then into the fall and I had a, you know, I had a jug of drinking water cause not potable water out of the well. And I realized that it was time to wrap this up when I started waking up in the morning and the jug of water was frozen. Oh, yeah. Because, by the way, Arizona gets cold. Uh, Northern Arizona is at like 6,000 yeah. feet elevation. Yeah. Flagstaff, good skiing there. Yeah. 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 I know a little something about the cold. <laughs> it's cold as shit. In Maine? Yeah. Yes. It's funny in Africa, too, in the Eastern Cape where we all go hunt. And it seems like in South Africa, a lot of the people that grow up there do not travel. You know, a lot of the PHs have not even traveled. Hmm. And even all Dave, little buddy, you, you know, he grew up in Northeast south africa near mozambique it's hot it's relatively flat it's pretty lush he had never been to the eastern cape he didn't even know yeah. there were mountains there i was like how do you not know there's <laughs> mountains here yeah and so he's terrified of heights and then you know six thousand feet elevation it gets cool in the evenings and in the mornings oh yeah, yeah you know I think even he in africa shorts too and he was, oh yeah he's bumming i've never seen him in pants no, like, what? cool that's weird statement <laughs> it's not cool it's fucking cold in the mornings there uh it snowed that one time remember yeah, I hunted in the snow there Jesus in Africa. Christ. How weird is that? And but Thomas, you also weigh a buck twenty five. Like you cold in the summer. Bro, you were cold too. Remember the time you didn't get a hot shower in the morning? Oh, I don't like that. The cold <laughs> shower in the morning. Uh uh-uh. uh. Hemingway I mean, wrote Snows of Kilimanjaro. Different part of the 
of Africa, but it, still snow. S- snows of Kilimanjaro here? Yeah. Is it really hunting if you don't get a hot shower in the morning and like a catered breakfast from a butler in tuxedo? Fucking caveman hunting. <laughs> they might as well give me a spear. It was like a bushman out Tim there. Wells. Like I was. Yeah, it was. I mean, it's roughing it. It's roughing it, Ian. I'm <laughs> telling you, man. Yeah, but soon your house is going to be good. You're going to be good to go. Yeah. Oh, the house. Man, I mean, you a, guys saw it's, it's almost really coming finished. together. It's coming together. It's coming together. <laughs> Did you guys see the land cruise I just got? I only saw the inside. Ooh. I think I saw pictures of it. The outside looks kind of like Rat. It's a, is it a seventy nine series? Yeah, yeah. Is, well, I don't. Is that what Rat has? That's what Rat is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, so it's that. So instead of the V eight, I have the six cylinder turbo right. diesel. And it's definitely one of the Friday production gun uh, trucks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they, yeah. They put the steering wheel on the entirely wrong side. I know. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. So I'm excited about that because I was I was over there. Andrew's always been like, you don't need your own car. You're only here a few months out of the year. You just use one of mine. And, uh, you know, it's like every time we're over there, one of them's in the shop, like one of Rasta's the having to use, yeah, Rasta <laughs> crashes one in the river, Julia's car's getting <laughs> service, and it, and there's like, Andrew doesn't have a car. Yeah. Like, he's riding a dirt bike around. Yeah, <laughs> I'm like, yeah. what car am I going to use of yours? <laughs> like, so this time I was just like, um, I'd like my own vehicle, please. Can uh, we get that done? Yeah. Now Rad's going to break it. I probably will. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, Rad. So my PH, he let me drive one night. And I saw the video of that. <laughs> oh, <he did>. yeah. <laughs> I don't think so, he'll let you drive so again. I was jumping all the th- I know. He sent me a thing this morning. Like his exhaust is all leaking and all this stuff. Oh, from cracking the, the manifold. Yeah, cracking the manifold. <laughs> and so they're covering it under warranty. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> he said, I felt, I felt bad for a minute. And then he was like, don't worry about it. It's under warranty. It's like, oh, I'll pay for it. Please don't drive my new Land Cruiser. <laughs> <laughs> Have you been to Africa, Ian? Hmm? Have you been to Africa? Yeah, once. Uh, I did a filming trip to Johannesburg and a little town up by Swaziland. Okay. So, film. We're, we're Johannesburg pros, us <laughs> guys. Oh, boy, aren't we? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was there visiting a collector who collected specifically domestic African and Rhodesian-made firearms. That's cool. And so I got That'd a probably ton be of, wild. That's oh, cool. they're crazy. They're oh. like prison guns. Pretty much, yeah. Wait, did they yeah. make the Is it Pancor? Is is that was no. Pancor African? No. No. Uh you're thinking the Neopup or the Nkunzi? Okay, yeah. Um I did meet with the guy who designed that. Yeah. Uh we did some videos on it. We took it out shooting. Really, really cool designer. He's brilliant. He's done a whole pile of different guns. Uh, fantastic guy. Like mm. he ought to get so hired. He ought to get hired at, at some high end firearms company. Q. Like, I was messing like, with someone else's sound, my bad. <laughs> someone like Q needs to hire Neofitu, give him like one assistant, two thirds of the budget that he wants, and stick him in a closet. And like once a year, some fantastically cool thing will pop out of that closet. What is this thing you guys are talking about that he did? Uh, so he did a shoulder fired semi auto 20 millimeter grenade launcher, magazine fed. Oh, that's cool. He designed the cartridge. It's 20 by 82, I think. Um, So the whole point of it was a high-velocity grenade. So it's about 1,000 feet per second. So it shoots like a rifle instead of shooting like uh, a 40 millimeter. Okay, so hit probability is good. And follow-up shots. The idea was like, oh, you've got a a vehicle IED coming at a a checkpoint. Instead of trying to lob a, a grenade at it, you can shoot it like a rifle multiple times. Or if you're out in the field, like, oh, there, I think there are some guys in those bushes. Instead of dumping a burst from a machine gun in, you have one or two rounds from this. Um, is the payload enough to really... Payload is definitely less. So I think Danell Land System says it's a five-meter lethal radius. Neofito is like, yeah, it's definitely a two-meter. Mm. Like, five is optimistic. Two is conservative. Uh, and then what's fantastic about it is he also made a belt-fed machine gun. Oh. Um, so you know this, I suspect. The hardest part of, if you're going to build a complete new gun from scratch, the magazine. Mm-hmm. So he designed... Boy, do I. Yeah, so, I we just did that. And he spent a ton of time on the magazine for the shoulder-fired gun. That's smart. For the belt-fed, the case is designed so it runs in a KPV belt. Completely unmodified. And KPV bolts are easy to get over there. Yeah, yeah. The del- delivery system for the ammo is where to start. What? About 400 rounds a minute. What caliber is it? Whoa, that's fast for a... Yeah, and the whole gun's only like this long. Oh. The barrel's something like 
16 inches because it's relatively low pressure, high bore, you know, large diameter bore, adding a long barrel doesn't really get you anything. It's a, it's an amazing gun and it's a real shame that Donnell is a complete dumpster fire of a company, especially now. South um, Africa is a tough place right now with the government and all. I think Donnell has actually, since I was out there, Donnell has declared bankruptcy, I think. They're being sold off. I don't know what will happen to it. Um, Colt did that a few times. They're all right. Colt did that a few times, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know how all right Colt is these days. Uh, what caliber was that uh, belt fed? 20, 20. Mil. 20 it's the same yeah. 20 oh, millimeter grenade. Oh, KPV, yeah. 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 All right. Well, okay, so you're in Arizona. Living up that bachelor life in the, the Jack Shack. Living in the, <laughs> yeah, that's what this was. Um, so you're living in this van. The, you, know, you start doing videos while you're living in the neighbor's barn? No. no. Um, so I started the website late in this process. Like I had moved down so to the you, city okay, you periodically started, to. Sorry, you make started money. with the website. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. And then YouTube comes along because I'm looking at some of these really weird mechanical systems. It's like how do you write an article describing the functions of say levered delay? Oh. It's, it's really obnoxious. You're right. Thinking about it. Cause I started, you know, when I started studying guns and all it was before the internet or before I ever knew about it. And so it was like small arms of the world. And you're right. You have to actually read And my reading comprehension is not great. So you have to read how these actions. Fun- yeah, that's, hmm. and what I realized a is way to do it. Well, you know what? I've got the gun here it'd be a lot easier to just take it apart and film it. And I can show how it works far more easily than I can write down how it works. Yeah, agreed. And so at that time, of course, I'm paying for bandwidth on the website. Oh. And like, I'm at this point, I'm dirt poor. I'm concerned about paying for uh, text and like make sure the pictures aren't too big in case a lot of people download them. Uh, and I have a few banner ad sponsors on the website. So it's, it's paying for itself more or less that way. But there's no way that I can host video on my own server. And uh, so I'm looking around and hey, there's YouTube. YouTube is this thing where those those complete fools will host my videos for free. Joke's on them. And uh, then I can put the link in my own blog through WordPress. And so I start posting video that way. Yeah, And it starts with occasional and then it it turns out to be a good medium. And so I try, I'm trying to do it like once a week. Once a month to start and then once a week. And after, it was a year or two, I think, I had somehow scrounged up enough subscribers that YouTube invited me into the monetization program. Like, we'll run ads on your videos. And that sounded like a cool thing. Yeah. Um, For a long time, though, like Amazon affiliate links on books were making me substantially more money than YouTube. Mm -hmm. And it's not not a lot of money. Um, But that was, YouTube didn't necessarily, wasn't necessarily the obvious long-term solution yeah uh what ultimately change what i think the the main radical change in the youtube channel's trajectory was the first time i went to rock island auction company i had a friend who was a collector who kept harping on me to go he's like it's just amazing they've got tons of guns and the day before an auction uh they have a preview day like everything it turns out all the auction companies do this but everything in the auction gets set out like a giant gun show and you can go in and just handle and fondle and look at everything because they want people who are potentially going to bid sure. to be able to inspect the guns. Like, And so, uh, you know, they're in Illinois. I was in Arizona. It was not exactly convenient. But I finally had one opportunity where I was traveling anyway, and I was able to stop in there on a preview day. And I went in with this little tiny potato quality camcorder that I had at the time and uh, made... I made probably like 12 videos in one day. And they're all like three minute videos. You can still see them. They're some of the real early videos on the, on the channel. Uh, I, you know, I found some employee. I'm like, do you mind if I make some videos? And they're like, what? Fine. Okay. Whatever. Fine. I guess. Sure. And so I start posting those, uh, like once that, that gave me enough content that now I can definitely do one a week. And I start posting them. And like a month later, I get an email from the Rock Island auction company saying, hey, we noticed that, you know, you've got some traction on some videos here. And we're not talking traction the way I have it today, but I was actually getting some views and there weren't people doing this sort of thing, really. And they're like, would would you be interested in coming down and filming before the auction and posting the videos before the auction? 
Like, that was pretty insightful, somebody from there. Yeah. yeah. To do that. Um, and it was the it, that guy who was doing it ended up being the guy that I worked with at Rock Island for years and years and years. Um, real cool guy, Joel. Joel Colander at Rock Island. Yeah. Um, and so I did that, and uh, that worked out really well. And in the aftermath of the first auction, um, they called me back, and they're like, yeah, we'd like to make this a regular thing. And so what what fundamentally I could do because of Rock Island is they had multiple thousands of guns in any given auction. So nice how things work out. So you get this huge right. library of stuff to make exactly. videos. Exactly. And I can go in there out of the 5,000 guns or in a premiere, it's like 2,000 guns. And I'm going to pick 25 that I'm going to film over the course of a week. Yeah. Like a huge, like a very dense availability of really good content. Yeah. Um, and that is when I started moving towards more than once a week. Mm. Um, and it, at first what it was is in the, in the month before the auction, I'll post a video every day. And after I did, I don't remember exactly. I did that a couple times. And then I'm at this point, I'm, I'm transitioning. I'm not really doing a website anymore. Now I'm doing a YouTube channel or a video channel. I still post to this day. I post everything to the website, but it's, it's become almost entirely video content. And, um, once I'm able to to get a filming process going and establish a little bit of a backlog of content, being able to go to auction houses, at that point, it, it ended up being five a year. I did three with Rock Island, and then I do two with Julia. So that's like a third of my annual content that I'm able to get in those reliable chunks of material. Yeah. And then you start posting that much, and it you the YouTube algorithm really liked that. So it... it showed videos to a lot of people and it really grew the channel. How long did it take you to get to a hundred thousand subscribers? Do you remember? I think I hit a hundred thousand in 2015, something like that. So, mm. so four years, four to five years. Yeah. Do you remember your first video? No. Well, the, so the first one we ever filmed was actually, what was it? No, I don't. You don't. It'd be easy enough for me to go back and look. Yeah, I was just <laughs> but off the top of my head, I I don't remember. What which video has um, garnered the most views? I think my biggest one is like ten million views at this point, and it is. I think it's an MG forty two shooting video. Yeah, uh, that would yeah. make sense. Yeah, it's the the really top ones are all kind of predictable. They're either really outrageous looking guns. Uh, the Calibri, the <laughs> the one, I, the most recent one that went really huge was the Gauss rifle that looks crazy and huge. I just showed you a picture of that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, MG, and then movie stuff, like World War II German stuff that's in video games and movies. You know, MG42 videos. The German stuff, like overall, because I'm sure a lot of your um, subscribers are international. Is the German stuff just internationally the most... Uh, you know, popular stuff. I haven't really done any sort of analysis on popularity specifically between the U S and outside the U S the German stuff is absolutely hugely popular in the U S yeah. and I think generally worldwide. Um, they had like the guns just have a different look. Yeah. Yeah. And, and they're popularized like they're in the movies. They've got this aesthetic appeal to them. They've got the, the evil bad guy aura. Yeah, I mean, Germany really had some shit going on different in World War II uh, over everyone else. Yeah. Uniforms, think, weapons, just... I think they, people that aren't even gun people yet or that want to get into guns, I think there's already this underlying reputation with German engineering, whether it be cars or anything, yeah. that I think people yeah. just understand, like, oh, then the guns are probably the same way, too. Yeah. And then, They're not wrong, really. No. What they don't realize is a lot of those guns were not great designs, and they shouldn't have done more of them. The like, thir- 34 is not incredible. Yeah. It's good in some ways. Yeah. Um, it's What's interesting to me is, especially from a collector's perspective, the 34 is a gun that requires, uh, like, what would it be, a Waffenmeister. You need your armorer's team because every couple of thousand rounds on a 34, like, it, it requires some adjustment. And if you get one today and it's not a, a, a nice all-matching original gun, probably not going to run you're going to need to do a lot of tinkering with barrels and bolts to find a combination that that runs reliably yeah like you're going to run a thousand rounds through the gun to figure out how to get the gun to run reliably Mm. and once you hit three thousand now maybe things are going to start getting out of whack yeah it's it's 
What's yeah. been the most controversial videos that you've done? Like, mm. does that, where do you get like a lot of hate or like what a spike in comments or what's, <laughs> well, do you get hate? I feel like you're probably the most, everyone has the most to like online. neutral. I know, but I feel like your it, reputation within the community, because I don't think you necessarily say anything super polarizing. I very deliberately avoid talking about politics. I avoid talking about stuff that is unnecessarily polarizing. Right. Um, and I'm really quite happy with the way I've been able to cover a lot of potentially controversial periods in history without delving, without getting a lot of hate from either side. Like the stuff I've done on Confederate guns has never been a problem. I tried losers. Um, the, the stuff I did on most of the Rhodesian guns went over pretty smoothly. Um, again, cause I'm focusing on the gun itself. Mm-hmm. Um, there's been some, um, Rhodesia, South Africa, probably honestly the things that have gotten the most controversy Really, to them. Yeah. So you get a lot, I bet he gets a lot of the, you know, he covers a certain type of gun or firearm and, you know, the 12 guys that think they know the most about it. Yeah. I was going to say, have you ever, has someone ever commented? I'm sure people come in all the time and be like, well, it's actually wrong or whatever. But has there ever been someone that has commented and corrected something that you put out and you were like, oh, whoops, they're actually yeah. right. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Um, I make mistakes in videos. Um, I try to avoid them. Yeah. And if I can't avoid them completely, I just really hope they're small mistakes and they usually are. But some of the comments, like the one of the few reasons I still read the comments is because I do periodically get really interesting, valuable comments. And yeah. a lot of them will come from if I post a video on something that's like a 1970s, 1980s military weapon, from a foreign country. A great example is the, the set me L mm-hmm. I got some comments from guys who are in the Spanish military who were serving with the set me L who were able to elaborate on, these are specifically the problems we had with them in service. And here's why. And, um, like the one thing that sticks in my head is the, the acronym set me, which stands for centro de uh, Studios Technicos, uh, it's like the Center for Special Technological Metallurgical Studies. But in the Spanish Army, they have a separate acronym, which is uh, shit in every hidden corner, <laughs> which abbreviates <laughs> out as set me yeah. because the gun's roller delayed and it's a nightmare to clean, uh, like to clean to a, a drill sergeant's approval level. Hmm. So a bunch of people right now are like, wait, roller design, roller delayed, it that's German. Yeah. yeah well, well, yeah, they're not. Yeah, <laughs> I have a video nope. coming on the French roller delayed gun from Mauser. So that whole design team, they start at Mauser. They discover roller delay accidentally because they've got roller locked guns um, like the 42. But then they go with a roller locked G43 and they discover that bolt bounce will cause it to sometimes fire when the rollers aren't completely engaged. And sometimes it like explodes, but sometimes it cycles. Because if you've got those rollers on an angled wedge at just the right point, it acts as a delayed blowback mechanism. And they see this and they're like, oh, that's interesting. Like we can cut a lot of parts out if it's not locked. And so they develop the roller delayed system right at the end of World War II. Uh, the roller delayed German World War II gun, they made 20 sets of parts and zero complete guns. But all those parts get captured by the Allies at the end of the war. Like every Allied country puts one together itself to test on. The Dutch have one, the Americans have some, the British have some, I'm sure the Russians got some. The engineers are at Mauser. Uh, they then go to work for the French for about five years. Uh, and there are some, or there's a bunch of French developmental guns that look like proto HKs. Like I said, I've got a video of one coming folding stock, integral bipod handguard in 30 carbine, select fire. That's cool. It's so cool. Yeah. 30 carbine. And then they get pissed off um, because I don't think they really liked working with the French. There's a little bit of animosity there. And none of their guns succeeded in the French trials. Like the French chose other stuff. So then these guys, there's, it's more than just one guy, but the, the primary guys then go to Spain instead because Spain offers to hire them. And it's in Spain that they essentially design the G3. Yeah. But it's the SEPMI. And then the Germans, a few years later, are looking for a new rifle and they test the SEPMI and adopt it essentially as the G3 but made in Germany. Hmm. It seems that your first video is the disassembly of the Fedorov... It's not. Aftermath. No. 
That's not it. No. So that's the chronologically first video that appears on the that was filmed for the channel, but I didn't actually film it. That was a friend of mine in the Royal Armories who filmed it. And like we planned to publish that footage but never did. And then I fa- I realized it like cuz if you look at the publication date, it's a year or two ago. I think. Or did I, maybe I just reposted it recently. It says 11 years ago. Oh. Okay, so maybe we did actually publish that at the time. Mm. But I'm not in it. I'm not the one running the camera, and I'm not the one actually doing the disassembly. And yeah. I I was there, but I'm not in the video. So Better I was a good hockey player, too. So that I was thinking about that. I was trying to figure out what was the first one that I was actually like the host of the what video. The, the check ZH29. That's probably it. So that it's video definitely 100%. yeah oh yeah. <laughs> no doubt. Yeah, yeah so that video came from a, a whole day at the range that we did with a collector by the name of robert ferris who if you start looking at older gun books you'll find his name in the acknowledgments of a ton of them he was a guy who worked for the aberdeen proving ground and then the yuma proving ground his job was shooting machine guns like he was involved in the tough life yeah he was involved in the m73 program the yeah. attempt to get a like a tank gun with a shorter receiver than the browning and on the weekends, he'd go out and shoot his own machine guns for fun. He had a fantastic collection, like world-class collection. Um, and, and he shot everything that he owned, essentially. And so we, I got to go out to the range with him and some other people once. And we took, I think we probably filmed four or five videos. But a ZH-29 was one of them. He had a ZK-420S. I don't even know what that one is. It looks like a Czech M14, but developed just after, uh, during World War II. Beautifully made gun, really interesting gun. A lot of the Czech stuff is incredible. Yeah. yeah. Um, we did some, like, half the videos from that session I've never published because the wind noise was so awful oh. that I can't use it. My early intro had a little segment of us shooting a Madsen light machine gun from that session, and I used a clip in the intro montage, but the actual video I can't use because the wind noise is just unbearable. Um, what was really cool is, well, Sort of really cool. He died five or six years later. That is cool. Uh, yeah, that's not the cool part. Um, his guns went, all his guns were sold at auction because he didn't have any inheritors. And the Julia Auction Company sold his guns. And those two specifically, the ZH29 and the 420S, that I had these just terrible potato cam videos from very early in the channel, those exact same guns came back to Julia. And I was able to do proper, much better videos on them oh, that's at cool. Julia like mm. eight, eight years later. You know what's cool about that, Madsen? Uh, no, not specifically. My youngest daughter, her middle name's Madsen. Oh. <laughs> for the, actually, for the sub gun. But. Okay. Madsen's an unfortunate company. Yeah. Like the light machine gun sort of worked, but like everything else Madsen did. Wrong time, wrong place, and they all failed. Nobody adopted the Madsen sub guns. Yeah, 1950. It was just, you know, I think the agency used it during, you know, in South America yeah. some. and They had them in inventory. I just thought it was such a, like, I've got one in such a fascinating gun. Like, let's clamshell it. Yeah. Put the mag loader inside and all. Like, yeah. what a weird thing you know overall. They, you know, they did a 308 battle rifle, Mm-mm. and they made it in 762 by 39 for the finish trials, too. Complete failure. It's like a, the most complicated AK action you've ever seen. Oh. Uh, that was a flop. Uh, they made a, a like a general purpose belt fed machine gun. Mm-hmm. That's I'm familiar with that. Yeah, the Madsen Sater. <coughs> that was a complete flop. Nobody bought. Well, like they sold a couple thousand to Indonesia, and that's it. Like everything this poor company did just yeah. didn't quite. Where work. are they? Are they American? Danish. Danish. So it's actually Madsen. You don't mm-hmm. pronounce the D. Hmm. which I've been told by every Dane who's watched those videos. What do they know? Yeah, well, we're not doing them in Danish, so whatever. Make your own videos. <laughs> Get your own club. Start your own YouTube channel. Danish is easy. You speak Swedish, but you have your mouth completely full of potato. Potato.